Proverbs chapter 30. The words of Agar. So now, 30 chapters, 29 have been written by Solomon, rewritten by kings. Chapter 30, we come to a new man. It's the only place we learn about him. The Holy Spirit knew. People wrote plenty of Proverbs, but the Holy Spirit inspired chapter 30. Even the prophecy. The man spake unto Ithel, even unto Ithel and Yukal. Now Yukal is a southern guy. And what you do is when you come up to somebody and you're talking to him and, and you say, did you call? No, I didn't call. So that's where he comes from. Surely I am more brutish. Now, if you want to have fun with a word, you take your, your Webster's 1828 and look at all the definitions for brutish. I wrote down some. Brute, beast, stupid, savage, gross, carnal. <laughs> That's a word you just want to have fun that you just want to go down to the store and buy after shave lotion with brutish. Huh? And it's sold. With definitions like that and, and aftershave lotion is sold. What happens if you put an aftershave lotion and said pure, clean, character? Than any man. So he's not raising himself up on pedestal. He's your average Joe or Agar. No one in particular. And we don't know nothing about him. But I would probably suppose some scholars in their classes and some idiot who wants to put a book out. You take somebody like this in the Bible, he's only mentioned once. And you got to write books and books about him. You know, the prayer of Jabez and... The proverb, of, hey, you know, it's just what the Holy Spirit wanted. There's a lot of people you don't know. And God knows them. That's what's more important. And as I've lived my Christian life, I realize that I'm unknown to some of the brethren in my own church. And there are people in church who I don't know. There are people that pass me by in the street ministry and don't know my name from Sam. There are probably saved Christian men and women in a nursing home who are going off into eternity to be with the Lord Jesus Christ and you don't know who they are and God does. And maybe all they're doing is praying. You don't have to be famous to be used by God. And have not the under and have not the understanding of man. I neither learn wisdom. Nor have the knowledge of the holy. Now, if you go to Proverbs 9 10, way back in the. when we first started, Proverbs 9 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. I neither learn wisdom nor have the knowledge of the holy. That's a big statement there. Well, what Solomon says. I have not the knowledge of the holy. I have no understanding. Now, 
And yet he's found in the King James 1611 Bible among the 66 books. He's in a chapter right after Solomon's writing that were copied out by Hezekiah, I believe it was. I neither learn wisdom, I haven't got wisdom, nor have the knowledge of the holy. Where is where is his standing? Who has ascended up into heaven? We don't even know when this guy was written and when he lived. With your 66 books before you, who has ascended up into heaven? I can tell you. Satan, Job chapter 1, Job chapter 2. The angels, when 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 Jacob uh, falls asleep and he sees uh, the ladder going up to heaven with angels ascending. Elijah. Oh, I can't think of it. Enoch. So when this guy writes, we don't know when. Jesus Christ ascended on high or descended you got the angels again with Jacob's ladder they, they were descending Satan I go walking through and to around the, uh, up and down the earth descended from heaven Lucifer descended from heaven There's a possibility that this guy has lived before Moses wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Or if he's after the, the death of Moses, he's got he hasn't read the books. If you want to date this guy, I'm not saying no, because I don't know. Who has gath gathered the wind in his fist? Well, Job speaks much about God and the characteristics in the being. We, we went through the book of Job. He might even before Job was written. And before we go even further, where are four verses of this unknown man that we have no idea where he's from? We can only guesstimate with no assurity. And yet, you Christian, who after 12 16 2014 is listening to this message this study and have a open Bible on your lap wherever you might be listening to this at work on an mp3 player you have 66 books in your Bible and you know more than Agar And Agar is in your Bible. You know you hold something that Paul didn't even have complete. You hold something even Jesus Christ. Listen, Jesus Christ did not walk around holding a Bible.
And his words and his gospels were not written to later. You know, Jesus couldn't pick up a book and say, okay, go to chapter 36, verse 5. What did I say? He couldn't do that. And what I'm talking about is we got such a blessing that we have the entire word of God sealed, set, and put before us in black and white and red, if that's your Bible. And what do you do with it? Now we're going to read some more questions. I'm going to, before I give, give you the answer, are you able to know the answer with the 66 books? Or are you completely in the dark like Agar, but Agar has an excuse and you don't? He may not have had the written word of Job. He may not have had the, the, the books written by Moses. You do. Who? He's asking questions. Who has bound the waters in a garment? I would take that as a cloud. The royal borealis looks like a curtain. Who's done that? We're going to the book of Ecclesiastes next, and, and a, a, a scholar, a great man of, of God, the king of Israel, is going to tell us about the water cycle of rain. We learned from the book of Proverbs that what idiots in America didn't realize in the Civil War. When you're treating blood and, and body parts, you wash your hands. Well, that was in the law, excuse me. That's even worse. That was written way before Proverbs. Moses taught you how to deal with surgical. And Americans didn't get that to the Civil War. And you want to cry baby about abortion and that. How many pregnancies ended up in death because the surgeon was going around just sticking his hand in, in, a, in a bucket of, of water? Man will get around to it eventually. But it's all in the Bible. See, what's the answer to that one? Who is your creator? Do you know? Do you know who Paul says the creator is? Or do you need to study to show thyself approved unto God, a man that need not be ashamed, but rightly divine the word of truth? Who has established all the ends of the earth? Well, that's talked about in Genesis 1 and 2. This guy may have been before Moses' writing. And I got a, a BC 700. And I got chapter 31, BC 1015. I don't know. I'm not going to run the commentaries. I'm going to run to the Bible. And it looks like this guy has not got the books of Mo Moses. I'll give him the benefit of doubt. Because M Moses says in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Now this guy has a lot of knowledge and wisdom. We'll look at. I don't think, and this is my think, and my think may stink. But it did say in verse 1 of this chapter, according to the Holy Spirit, the prophecy. So I am not going to step out and say that this, that this is a guy who don't believe in God or an agnostic, and the Holy Spirit would put him in the Bible. The, the Holy Spirit wrote to us, he's a prophet. I know 31 is a king. Now, this is just the word. Okay, this guy's a prophet. The next one's a king. So, what is the answer? Who has established all the earth, ends of the earth? I've already told you the answer.
What if somebody came up to you somewhere, anywhere in your life? And they asked you a question. Doesn't Peter say that we're to be ready to give everyone an answer of truth? Somebody just came up to you, wherever. I see you got a Jesus shirt. I see you got a Jesus hat. I see you got these, this thing that says piece of paper in your, in your pocket, God loves you, or whatever. What, who has established all the ends of the earth? Just let me ask you a question, you know. I don't want to debate you. These people say the earth is, it was made by the Big Bang. This, what do you say? What answer are you going to give them? God made it. So? Can you give the guy, if you ain't got a Bible, can you give the guy three passages of Scripture? Can you show where God made the earth? Can you show where the Holy Spirit made the earth? Can you show them where Jesus Christ made the earth? Or are you just going to offer, yeah, it just happened, like the evolutionists say. Now, here's a particular question he asked. You know, we're breaking down the, the verses. We're not looking ahead. What is... Wow, here, here we go with the feminist movement. What is his name? I wonder what that one is in the feminist Bible. Probably what is its name. Then you probably come up with a name that could be male or female. I walked by the high school today. I was watching those kids come out. You couldn't tell if they were boys or girls. Male or female. I wouldn't want a God that you couldn't tell with a male or female. I couldn't even tell by his name. Now, I'm not saying, listen, if you got a name that could be male, that's not, I'm talking about God. I wouldn't want to have a God who doesn't know what he is. What is his name? Have you answered that? If you said Jesus, you're kind of wrong because then he says, what is his son's name? Uh-oh. Do you know what the first name is? What is his name? I am. You know what that is in the Bible? At least you know where to find it if somebody asks you. It's in Exodus. And he doesn't have Acts 4.12, is it? Where by the name of Jesus, every man must be saved. There's no great no name uh, amongst men whereby you must be saved. See, he knew something. He's not an agnostic. He knows in his God, and he knows in his God's Son. He knows something. If thou canst tell. I'm not going to be a scholar and try to read in what this guy's doing or he's saying. I don't know. Maybe he wants you to think. Maybe he knows. You know the best way to deal with somebody who's lost is make them think. You ask the questions. Don't let them ask you how many giraffes were in their heart and how many uh, different uh, reptiles were in the ark and all that and where did King get. You ask them a question. You make them think. Let's look at verse 5 now, this guy. Every word of God is pure. Whoa! Did you just hear that earthquake, the crumbling? 
I just heard every Bible cemetery fall to the ground and, and crack open and, and fall into the gates of hell like like the men of no, uh, Moses' time. This guy's not a scholar. Because a scholar will not say every word because we got to change the Z's and the I's because you can't understand it. Jonathan, you're an SOB. We've got to take Jesus out of the Bible in some places. We've got to remove the Bible, uh, the words in certain places, the blood. Every word of God is pure, and he doesn't even have the 66 books. How about that? What we got to do? We got to hire an agar. For our Bible classes, we need more agar. We need more of them to come up and state the truth. Man, he said a lot in five verses. Every word. You know how many words there are in the Bible? You thought I was going to tell you. I have no idea. I wouldn't even try to guess. I would laugh if it was like a 7777 something. But I don't know. You know how many words there are in the modern versions compared to the King James Version? A lot less. Maybe a lot more. I don't know. But it's not the same. I could give you Bible chapters where the modern Bibles have less or more. How's that happen? How do you get every word of God is pure and you can't even get the Bibles to match? So when you take the word out, oh, what's that word? It says Jesus tells his brothers, I. I'm not going to go to the feast but now. I forget what it is, but there's one word they take out there. And then when he shows up, it makes him a liar. You remove all of Mark 16. At the, the last of Mark 16, you know, going all the world, and, and these signs shall follow. You remove all that. Every word of God is pure. You know what pure is? That's a good, that's just, the Lord just showed me that. Somebody goes, well, you know, they say the Bible is written by man. It can't be. Every word of God is pure. Pure is without man. If you're going through a store and a product says pure, you laugh at it. Because it came from machinery or men's hands. You're trying to tell me something as pure as made in a plastic bottle or a cardboard box or a, a, a glass bottle? You mean to tell me that the, the, the vessels and the bowls and what, the containers, whatever that product is made, it's been clean every single time? There's no dust? Every word of God is pure because it's by the Holy Spirit. We don't know all the names of the wise men. That's pure. We do know about the wise men. He? He who? Who's the he? Are you telling me that, that this guy, who's a prophet, verse 1, Turn my pages. Let's read these. Let's read the prophet, verse 1. The words of Agar, the son of J Jacob, even the prophecy. He. He. It doesn't say every word of God is pure. God is a shield or the word is a shield. It says he. This guy knows John 1 1. 
This guy knows the Father, the Word, and the Holy uh, Ghost or Spirit. I don't know. What, and over there in First John, this guy who knows that God has a Son's name, that He is the Word. Well, that blows the Roman Catholic Church because the word to them is she, Mary. This guy knows about God. He knows about the creatorship of God. He knows about God's Son. And he knows the word of God. And he knows the word is the Son. And look, is a shield. Ready? What's the Bible say about your shield? What is it? Faith. Ephesians 6. Does he have a copy of Ephesians? Never mind Ephesians 6. In Ephesians 6, it's called the field of uh, the shield of faith unto them that put their trust in him. This guy just told you the definition of your faith, your shield as a Christian, long before Paul wrote anything, long before Paul was born. You match Ephesians 6 with verse 5, and you got the definition of your shield of faith. It's trust. Match that with Hebrews 11.1. 1. This guy is no agnostic. This guy is no atheist. This guy is right and under the inspiration. And, and he says, he says in humbleness, surely I am more brutus than any man. I am just like your common Joe and have not the understanding of a man. I neither learn wisdom nor have the knowledge of the holy. You have more knowledge than a Christian today who's been brought up since a church nursery than church, uh, the children's uh, Sunday school and sits under a preacher three times a week. I would be scared to go to any church Throw a dart on a wall, on a map of a wall, and go out and ask the people Bible questions, Bible names, and be scared to what answer I would get. This guy would be thrown out, rejected, cursed. At a Bible seminary or a cemetery. Why? Add thou not unto his words. Uh oh. Does that say that in any modern Bible? It does. And yet they do it. This verse has not been changed in those Bibles. And yet they do it. Least he, God, or the word itself, Jesus Christ, reprove thee. And thou be found a liar. It says we're going to get a new name in heaven. you imagine if you're saved and you change the word of God and your new name is liar? That's what he says. you imagine getting a re reproof, getting a scolding at the judgment seat of Christ by Jesus or the great white throne judgment if you're lost for changing the word of God? Can you imagine Jesus Christ? I, I, I'm going to be funny here. Okay. Here's a Bible corrector. Save the law. He walks up to Jesus. 
And Jesus' nose is gone. And he looks at Jesus and he's got an extra finger. He's got a third row of teeth. And his shoulder's gone. He's got two elbows on one arm and missing the elbow on the other arm. You say, Brother Stiley, okay, call the, call the wagon. What's wrong with you? If the word is Jesus Christ, John 1, 1, and you have added to Jesus an extra elbow and removed his nose, you made him look like this, this modern art where you look at it and you can't figure out what he even supposed to be. And you're standing there before Jesus like that, and you're saying, that's exactly what you made me to be. A freak. That's what the modern Bibles do. They cut words out. You might as well just cut Jesus' nose off. They add to the word. You might as well give them an extra elbow. And Jesus will stand before you and call you a liar and reprove you for what you've done. Okay. We're not going to get far today. We're going to look at the character of this guy. Now. Two things I require of thee. Two, that's it. My first wish, you know, three wishes is I want three more wishes. My second wish, I want three more wishes. My third wish, I want ultimate wishes. Two things I require of thee, God. Deny me them not before I die. Job 13, 20. This is a petition to God by this wonderful man. I now count him as a wonderful man. Yet, yeah, but I don't see no books about this guy. I see books about Jabez in, in one or two verses. And because of what his mother prayed. The prayer of Jabez. How about the wisdom? You see, you can't have the wisdom of this guy here. Because you can't sell it in a college or in, in a modern Bible because it tells you not to add, not to subtract from the word. You can't match this guy on a Christian bookshelf at the bookstore. Because when everybody closes the door for tonight, he's going to flap those gods on the ground like Dagon. I can just see this guy walk up and start kicking his book off the shelf. What do you think you are changing my God, my son, my God's son's name? And they get up in the morning, there's all the books and the modern Bibles on the floor and the other junk. Guy has character. Okay, let's see what he wants. Remove far from me vanity and lying. He would never become a politician. In his life, what he does will result in something for God. Vanity is emptiness. And whatever he does, he wants to be productive. If he sleeps, he wants to sleep so his body needs the rest. He doesn't waste gas. 
He doesn't drive around in big circles for no purpose. Give me neither poverty nor riches. He's going to explain himself in a minute on that one. Feed me with food convenient. So let's go to a convenience store. You see where that you see where convenience store comes from? Comes from a King James 1611 Bible. But he ain't going to spend his money foolishly because he's already told you uh, vanity. He's not going to buy something an extra 85 cents unless he has to. Convenient. You know what Paul is writing to the Corinthians? If they slop a piece of meat to you, eat it. But if it's dedicated to the idol, then don't eat it. And that piece of meat slapped down for you. Don't ask. Just eat. They would take the meat and they would, at times, they would offer it to their gods or goddesses. If there's no questions, no doubt in your mind, go ahead and eat it, Paul would say. That's convenient. If they would tell you, okay, this meat is given to the great God, then you didn't get meat that day in your conscience. That wouldn't be convenient. Okay? For me. I don't want steak. I'll give you what... Uh, I will take what you give me, God. I wonder how many people have gone to church fellowships and when they get up there finally to where, where the food is... I wonder how many complain about, oh, that's not here. We're going to have that. It was dry. It was terrible. That's a violation of what this verse is saying. I have heard out of my own two years that when people are, are they're fed at a rescue mission or a, a, a place to, for the, the homeless at a church, they sit there and complain what they've been given. Listen, when you're homeless and you're a church that, that feeds you feeds you food, that is the proper definition of food convenient for me because you don't get a choice. Hey, God, want to walk right there and be... No, just what you give me and everybody else, nothing more, nothing less. If you give them three pieces of, of, of meat... I like three pieces, not two, not three, not four, not come back for seconds and thirds. That's what that means. And he wouldn't say, oh, we have this week after week after, he wouldn't say that. He would count his blessings and name them one by one. Agar will give you a snarling face when you grump and complain in church. He's not the kind of guy you would want around. And the rest of his chapter, he's going to make you think. And we're just looking at who he is. I'm, we're not even going to get as far as what I thought we were going to get. It's okay. we got time. The Lord comes. Comes now. Amen. You get to watch me go off into glory. And then live with your hell on earth. I, I, that person the other day, oh, this is hell on earth. I wish God would give me an opportunity when the rapture happens to turn around and look back with a big horn and say, No, you can have your hell on earth. All right, here's the reasoning. Least I be full, stomach, pocketbook, closet. I got to go rent out more space. 
If you gotta go rent more space, you've got too much junk. You need a yard sale. Cause it ain't gonna go with you no matter which direction you go, up or down. No one needs so much junk that you gotta put in your budget to have a, a excess of space to pay for the rent. That's what this guy's saying. Lisa, I be fool and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? It's the company. It's my employer that gives me the check Friday. It's I've worked for it. I got the gusto. I'm going to do whatever I want with it. I did it my way. My stocks, my bank account, my IRA, my pension. Good old land of America. Na, 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 na. And stand before God, lost or saved, and say, oh, by the way, it was you. There are Christians out there that the success they have. It's anything but God. I've had two events happen this week to me, and it can only be God unless Satan's trying to destroy me. I'll give God the praise for now for it. And if it's, it's continually God, I'll give him continued praise, and if it's Satan, then I'll give God the praise. And be careful. Now that matches riches and too much food. America needs to learn by living by what's convenient because there may not be no food tomorrow. You know, the government is so powerful, it can come overnight while you're sleeping and take everything away without you even knowing it. Or, heck, we'll just have a couple more criminal trials and, and let the guy be innocent when, and then just let the people go out there and do it for them. And they won't even take the stuff off the shelf, will they, my dear? They'll just burn the places down. That takes care of a lot of can, uh, can and packaged goods, doesn't it? Haven't you realized in these riots in the last few years, the cops have not tried to stop them? But our troops are over in Afghanistan trying to stop the few people over there. But we can't call the troops in over America and put it to a military force. But we can stop a guy and a, and, a, and, a, and his wife in a business because they won't put two faggots on, on a sodomite cake. We can stop him. I got the proper way to end these riots. Attention all citizens of particular city, if you're right and you have nothing to do with the thing, you have three hours to vacate the area. Because in three hours, we're going to launch a couple of 24 missiles from our, our submarines now off the Atlantic Ocean. We're going to test them. So if you don't want to be part of it, evacuate because missiles will come in three hours. Oh, 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 oh. Hey, they're criminals! If they were doing that in the oil fields of Iraq, we'd be over to kill them left and right. It's the priorities. Being rich. You know, every single president in this modern era has been rich. They own abundance. And they're going to tell you, the little class, how to do something. That's the bunny trail. All right, or at least I be poor, okay? Poor. And steal. Remember we talked about last night, I believe, about stealing? And take the name, run it back to four. He knows who the name of God is. 
in vain. This guy is so concerned for God. And so reliance upon God, he says, God, please let me not ever have to steal because I will do your name injustice. Let me read again for those who forget. Before, I forget this guy's name, for little LaGuardia became a popular mayor in New York City in 1933. He was a judge. One day he presided over a case of a poor man who had stolen a loaf of bread to feed his family. Recognizing that by the law the man must be fined $10, LaGuardia paid the fine himself, then fined everyone in the courtroom 50 cents for living in a town where a man has to steal bread in order to eat. The judge had to bail him, collect the fines, and give them to the poor thief. Well, I read in the paper, this guy paid everybody. There's something going on in the papers today. That people are doing that. They, they pay for the five people in line for the, at the McDonald's. So they're doing that just to get their, their, their thing in the newspaper. And probably a receipt publicly for the IRS. But that's not happen regularly in America. And this guy is saying, God, if I have to steal a loaf of bread, I don't want to shame you. This has been my prayer. And God has fulfilled this prayer. I have not been too rich. And I have never been too poor. And thank God I have never had to go without food. But the days may come. This guy's prayer. This guy's ambition. This guy's effect upon the word of God. And his questioning. would make him an outcast and the center of gossip in any church in the world today. You gave him a modern Bible and he, he, he would chuck it. You gave him a, a, a piece of whatever somebody had brought from a fellowship and he would take it and Thank God and bless and bless the meal and eat it. And if it tasted horrible, he wouldn't say nothing about it. And somebody would would pray, Oh Lord, let me win the lottery. Let us have good rain for our softball game Saturday or for our fellowship picnic. He would pray and say, Lord, just let me help me to be content and not to dishonor you. And I got some questions for you. Talking to people. I got some questions. What do you know? He would go around the church and say, Hey, hey let me ask you a question. And then he would give you he would give you a Bible question. And he would expect an answer. And when you give those questions in verse four, you better not change the Bible, verse five and six, to answer the questions. Look at that. You know, he's telling you, he said, don't be afraid to say, I don't know, and go find out. <laughs> there would be no portrait of this guy's face or name written on any of the, the cemeteries of, of Bible schools in America. You wouldn't find his name in any of the boards or references or, or, or anything of a modern Bible. His name would be absent. Though some Bibles, the modern Bibles, you do know they have lesbians. And they do have perverted religions. Of the, followed by the, the background of those names that are in those Bibles.
And he would be a King James Bible believing 1611 man. You know what you know what this guy would do? I gotta look up his name. I wanna make sure I get it right. Agar. He would come up to, to you, Christian, uh, like the old English menu. He would slap you in the face twice. The fact is you have a complete Bible and you don't know nothing. He would slap you in the face three times and kick you in the shin if you got a completed Bible and you don't do what God told you to do and you do your own little thing. He would kick you down to the ground and stomp you if you come up with your program instead of just the gospel. See, Agar for doing it God's way. And then when you would say something about uh, uh, the gospel magic or magic gospel, shall he say, give me a chapter and verse. The Bible says, go in your own world and preach the gospel. And they put on tricks and shows and everything like that, using the ways of those men that did before Pharaoh and changed Pharaoh's heart before Moses and Aaron. Agar would say, let's stick to the Bible. Let's go house to house. Let's find faithful men and, and, and ordain them and get them to, to, to build churches. He would be against the mega church movement. He would say, hey, you got 30 people in, in this house as a church. That is five more than what you can handle right now. You take five people and you ordain them and let them start a church in their house. He would say, rather have one big church in the, in, in the county, he said, let's have 500 home churches in the county. Instead of paying money for gas, let them give it to money for a missionary instead. Decrees and stuff on the wall. Well, I got God and I got the word of God and I know who his son's name is. And this is the guy who's in the Old Testament, by the way. Maybe before the law. This is a wonderful man. Agar. Now. Gotta hurry up, we're running out of time here. Can you shut up in a minute? You want a challenge? Here's a proper challenge. Go start asking your Christian friends that, who Agar is. It's in the Bible. What kind of answers do you get? Ask them about Goliath, a man who was against God, and find out how much they know about Goliath, and find out how much they don't know about Agar. 